I guess I'm going to try to respond to, this is a, a couple of questions that have been raised to me from, from various subscribers. I haven't been posting a lot of videos lately, but I have been getting lots of personal messages from people, and I'm sort of responding back and forth to some folks, and I guess at a certain point it just gets easier for me to just post a response rather than try to type out particular responses, especially if I feel like the things I'm saying are probably more relevant to just this person uh, who is asking. So, okay, the there's really, I guess, three things. Well, the, the one is person, and I've already posted so many videos on this, and I said to the person, well, I'll see these videos, and they kind of gave me, well, can you say more about X, Y, and Z? But asking about how does one construct a meaningful life, or they were sort of asking me about my early life and how did I decide what I was going to do and make some of those decisions or sort of those characterizations of, I don't know, how did I decide to become a professor and or what was my advice for meaningful life? It sort of blew into to various things. And I guess, <clears throat> okay, the way that I would try to come into some of this is I would say that, um, well, a couple of things. One is I, I grew up out in the sticks and I grew up out in the woods. I didn't grow up around a lot of TV. I didn't really even grow up around a lot of books. And I, um, I discovered books and ideas and the whole world of, of like intellectual engagement, this kind of stuff, probably my, I don't know, late in high school, something like this. You know, that's when it really dawned on me that this was a possibility for me. And I got excited about it, but I knew it was kind of a long shot. And I guess if I if I were to be most honest about it, it did come from. I think it came from a lot of things. I think there was a uh, there was a sort of focus from athleticism. I was very much a runner, and I did a lot of both rollerblading, roller skating. I did you know speed skating. Um, I did lots of other kinds of skating too. I did wall scene. I mean, I did a lot of things on roller skates. Uh, I also. And, and I did swimming, I did, you know, I did horse things. I did a lot of different, um, I guess, outdoor sports. But r running in particular, I think, gives one a kind of focus. And I think the issue of focus was so crucial. And then when when I met Lee Thayer at uh, where I was getting my undergrad at Wisconsin Parkside, that's, I think, where it really dawned on me that... I was, by and large, I don't want to think of it this way, but now in hindsight it looks this way, I was kind of sitting by the sidelines of life. I think I kept waiting for it to happen. Like, I kept waiting for life to happen to me. I don't think I, I got at first that, you know, life isn't a spectator sport, that, that you need to get in and actively commandeer a life for oneself. And it depends upon just really opening to, I guess, in, in a kind of humility and an excitement. It's, it's a blend, but of, of having some questions and trying to get solid responses to them, to be able to formulate responses given the sense that you think a lot of people just don't have responses to them. So if you, you try to find those questions or issues, I guess that people either don't know much about or you think are just grossly misinformed about and to try to become as knowledgeable as you can about it. And I think part of the problem is this question of how to, how to adequately frame what it means to say that people sit by the sidelines of life. Now, there is no sidelines of life. Every person is sort of caught in the world. But there does seem to be a sense in which I think it has to do with mass entertainment technologies. So there's t television and radio and programs are on and it's there's like a world that goes on without one. And you feel like you have to keep up with it and get into it and all this kind of stuff. And then there's a world that is I guess recognized as out there but also recognized as doesn't do anything without you actively making it do whatever it does. And it's to try to focus on those parts of the world where 
your presence makes a difference. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of like a recipe for being powerful, right? If you want to be powerful, only access information that you could or can or do act upon. The more information that you access that you can't act upon or really couldn't or uh, just won't, you're going to feel less and less powerful in your life. I think many people feel trivial, they feel irrelevant, and they feel powerless because they're continuously accessing information as they bobble from site to site where they're basically with one theme, will a stranger please tell me what I'm supposed to find interesting right now? It's like that's the theme of what's going on. They, they don't know how to commandeer their life in terms of setting a keystone. And the keystone is, here's my life's goals. And it doesn't have to be what, you, what kind of job you want to have. It, it might have to be something larger than that. Like what kind of person does one want to become? And once you set the keystone, then everything else can become relevant or irrelevant. But if you don't have any serious goals, if you're not up to something, you know, it, all of life's differences, they can't show themselves as meaningful or unmeaningful. They can't show themselves in their informational value without your goal seeking, without your having particular aspirations and moving toward them. You know, there's so much of Anthony Wilden's work, and I have so many videos on this, but it's, it's really important for people to understand that there isn't just information, quotes, in the world that has a value independent of particular context or independent of particular uh, organismal goal seeking. That it's, you know, the world, even the humanly produced world, I mean, the world globally understood is a series of endless varieties of differences. There's just endless varieties of differences. And those become coded into various kinds of information and the particular information that they do get coded into, it's some function of the goals and the, um, the values and you know, what, the, what the organisms, what the people are bringing to those differences. Um, and so I think part of it is about learning how to, to ignore the outer world. And by that I mean that world which makes you feel like a tag along. That world that makes you feel like you're potentially irrelevant and it goes on without you and it could care less about you, the more that you can disentangle from that world and the more that you could only get yourself in those situations where you're moving toward those kinds of information uh, banks, those, those forms of, uh, I guess all of those forms of situations which directly relate to the kind of person you're trying to become. And so I think part of this, it is difficult because it needs to be placed within this larger context that it, it's sometimes the goals and the aspirations which they lend a kind of energy or they lend a, a weightiness that can't be taken from a less significant goal. That is, things that are trivial or bureaucratic, it'll take great amount of your personal energy to see those through. But a lofty goal, something that you think is ennobling, uplifting, and something that is important, it, in its very importance, may give you energy. That is, you can draw some of your power from the very goal that you put yourself up to. And I think part of the reason that some people struggle is because they want to play it safe, right? And the, the wanting to play it safe by setting their sights low, and you have this kind of low-visioned realism. You say, look, you got to be realistic, right? Don't be, don't be so high-minded. People give this kind of stuff. And they're telling you don't be delusional, right? Don't, don't have fantasies that will never come true, but there's another sense in which you live an impoverished, trivialized life if you don't actually aspire to greater than what you could do. 
Now, it's again, it's somewhat controversial, but you know, there's a great line, John Stuart Mill, says, a person who is never asked to do more than he possibly could do will never do all that he can. And we can talk about it, you know, it's controversial, it has insight. I think that the general point, though, is that people who really, maybe they have a quieted, secret, closeted, never, never said goal of just wanting to get by, but if they literally try to live by and vocally espouse and put into practice and habit and, and try to put into the fiber of both their, their personal life and their public um, expression an attempt to bring about great things, that can, again, it can lead energy and it's part of what um, makes doing things a little better than you would have thought possible. So it's sort of like, you know, if you want to achieve at a certain level, if you always try a little higher, you'll be sure to, even if you don't get as high as you thought, you're going to be pretty sure to get uh, where you're, you're really trying to get, right? And so again, some of it has to be, um, it has to be, I guess, more than, and it, and it can't just be hoodwinkery or trickery. You can't really have your, vol, your goal be just, I just want a job, but I'm going to pretend and publicly say that I want something more than this. No, it has to be that your fears and your doubts get closeted and your aspirations, as vulnerable as they make you, those have to be part of what you use to get yourself to commit to them. They become the, you know, the signing on the dotted line that now you, you have obligations to live up to what you said you were going to try. I think the fear of responsibility is probably, it's probably the major thing. I think many people don't know what to do with their life not because they don't have dreams and aspirations, but they, they, the problem is that they don't want to voice it because if they voice it, they fear they'll look foolish if it doesn't come true or they'll feel like now they have some responsibility for trying to bring it about. And the, even the bringing about, let me see if I can turn to, and this is related, another person had asked about student advice and wanting to go to college and should they go to college and should they not and how did I go to college and I'm... <clears throat> I guess I'm all over in all of this, but uh, I think, you know, the thing that I would say there is many students, when they're trying to pick a major, they do this, should I pick this major? Should I pick that major? And they're, they're really concerned about the major. And, and should they be concerned? Yes, the major is a good concern. In the long run of life, does the particular undergraduate degree major that you picked really matter? Probably not that much. Now, again, it depends upon the field, but probably not that much. Ideally, what that degree represents is a capacity to learn. And if you really have got yourself in the learning mode, not just in the knowing mode, but if you've learned how to learn and can, uh, you know, again, realize commencement means beginning, right? And you, you see yourself as now uh, uh, the beginning of a lifelong learning project because you've been so capacitated. I think there, you're starting to own the, the responsibility in the right way. That is, the person who wants the degree to carry the weight of the responsibility, when they say, oh, I want to pick this, and they agonize over which degree. I mean, it makes sense to, to agonize a little bit. But when you try to understand the agonizing, you see it a little bit more clearly as it's, it's a hidden or disguised evading responsibility or trying to make something other than the implementing of the decision to be the, the responsibility. It, you know, it's not the deciding of the major, it's how one implements and carries that out. And I do think there are so many students who, unfortunately, and I think this was largely me when I began, now I learned my way out of it as I got my way through and I had some wonderful classes with Lee Thayer and that really changed my orientation in my undergrad and I fortunately had him as a sophomore which really you know it, it put me on a right path uh, but it's I think there is a kind of going through the motions where people show up they don't really have questions they're not really sure why they're there they're 
yeah, yeah, just kind of sitting, hanging around, and they're waiting for other people to tell them when they're educated. They say, well, how many credits do I need? And, well, so, well I fulfilled the number of credits, and I took the, the number of courses in this area and the numbers of the, in credits in that area, and I had this grade point average. I'm supposed to be college educated now. And it's, it's literally like they think that it's they're there, and they're just showing up, going through the motions of a world that kind of is already in process and going on independent of them, and they just kind of hook in. It's like a bus, and they just have a seat on it for a little while, and then they're going to get off the bus later. Are they radically transformed along the way? I don't know. What they're supposed to be doing is saying, look, 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 all of these things like credit hours and uh, the degree requirements, and th these are suggestions and recommendations, and they are, and they're, they're going to be requirements, you're going to have to take them, right? But there's another sense in which a student should say, well, I can take more than what's required, right? Uh, when a professor hands out a wimpy syllabus and there has meager reading and not sufficient amount of pop quizzes, the person should drop that class and go find a more rigorous professor, a more rigorous class. They might say to the professor, can you offer some additional readings? I've already read all the material that's available here. Uh, it's about actively, actively pursuing one's life goals by using the resources that are available. It's not about going there and telling and having them tell you what you need to know. Like if you're going to go to college and what you really want is to learn how to be told what to do, you're probably not getting what you're supposed to be getting. What you're supposed to be getting is a capacity to learn how to commandeer your, your experiences, um, the, the kind of situations that you put yourself in, and you're doing it by using the resources that are available there or creating resources as need be, right? I mean, you may have to engage in selective procedures of, you know, avoiding some, some classmates, some classes, and actively pursuing uh, other classes. But it's not about um, something that's going on there. It's, it's about learning how to, how to own it. Right? I think it has to do with consumerism and our prepackaged world. Right? We live in a world where almost everything that people encounter now comes prepackaged. It's, it's canned, it's microwave ready, it's remote control accessible, and it's designed to be user friendly. And it's designed to not make encroachments upon a person, not make demands upon a person. And then people are bringing those sensibilities into school and they're imagining that school or a degree is going to do something for them. They'll use that expression. Well, I won't go, hopefully this is going to do something for me. Or even worse, you know, a student will go to school and then later on they will say, well, the degree didn't work out. And it's like, well, degrees don't work. It's not a thing that does things. It's, it's a piece of paper that represents and it can only represent what you've put into it. Now, they say, no, it represents 120 credit hours and it represents a certain number of classes. That's the mistake of trying to deal with the world as it is, quotes, out there, independent of you, just doing what it is. Um, this, again, this kind of social world to which you can tag your little train into. That's so different than trying to, as best one can, commandeer one's life and with vision and purpose and use the resources that are available there. You know, my colleague, my wife, Valerie Peterson, has a wonderful gym metaphor that she uses. And I think it's very apt. You know, when there are some people who, when they go to the gym, they will spend money and they'll buy fancy clothing and they'll be seen talking with people. Are they really there to exercise and to get fit? No, they like the idea of getting fit. Are they into getting fit? Are they actively pursuing what they need to pursue to get fit? No, not really. Uh, and then they, those may be the same people who are complaining about, you know, there's one broken machine and they, they go, oh, I paid all this money here and I, I can't even get fit because there's this one broken machine. That's the one that I like, whatever. There's other people, there are other people who they, 
They didn't spend that much on their clothing. They're not too concerned over chit-chatting with other people about how people are, are dressed. And if, if they see a bad machine, they probably just avoid it. And they go find those machines that enable them to get a good workout. And they're much more interested in being fit than in thinking about the idea of being fit. Right? Uh, I guess maybe one last thing is uh, to, to try to get people to, to really ask themselves why they are in school. See, I think there are some people who they're there because they have questions and they're hungry and if they do have questions and they are hungry and they know how to actively pursue with zeal and passion what they want to be when they grow up and use all those resources accordingly and even invent resources if needed, they should stay in school. If there are other people who have no questions, have no idea why they're there, and the only reason they're there is because they couldn't talk their parents out of it and they think everyone else tells them that they have to be there, but really, they just don't feel like they should be there, they probably should drop out. They're probably wasting their own money, maybe someone else's money, and very likely the, uh, their time. Uh, you'd want to go back and do school if you're going to do school. I don't think, you know, it will take many people a degree to realize that they don't need one, right? I'm not saying that they don't need one. I'm saying they took them a degree to realize they didn't need one. Uh, th there is a kind of irony there, but I don't think, you know, you need a degree. You need what that represents. It's just most people, they seem to struggle with learning how to grab life as you know, by the proverbial bull by the horns, and make it happen without um, without other people's assistance. Okay, I I can't end it there. You know, I wanted to end it there, and I just can't because I have to say some other things about the concern I have over the rise of of Leo of neoliberalism in in modern Western culture. And I do. I want to sell the individual striving success story. I want to sell the bootstrapping story. I believe it is possible. I believe that there are people who... Uh, and, and see, here, here's the difficulty. The, the, dif the difficulty is that people, they're not just machines in the sense of some machines are smarter than others and some are dumber than others or some are more capable and less capable. The problem is that humans are self-understanding organisms and some can be very smart but think they're dumb. They can be caught with doubt and reservation and self-criticism. And there can be other people who maybe aren't that smart. They're pretty smart. Uh, but they have some self-doubt, but maybe they're arrogant. Then there can be other people who are arguably further behind, have some deficits, maybe a long haul to really cultivate them beyond uh, beyond average and yet they may they may believe that they're utterly brilliant and so you have this this issue of competency versus self-understanding and that's what makes it so problematic and I think this is part of what makes the seductions of neoliberalism possible right the bootstrapping story I think we continuously give to every incoming class. So every class comes in and we tell everyone, look, you can do it, you can bootstrap it. Partly you know that there are some people in there who aren't going to be that person, but you're not going to be the person who's going to be able to tell who that person is. See, each person, they kind of have to believe the story enough to actually act upon it in order to discover if they really were someone who had been radically underestimating what their capacities were. See, some people will never get in those situations, but the neoliberal story of, of your, you need to bootstrap and become an individual success story, and if you're not, you're a failure. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's related to Reaganomics. It's related to, um, you know, think of the Oprah Winfrey story, right? I mean, Oprah is such a great case, right? A black female from Chicago who's billionaire, Right? And we say, you know, if this person was able to do this, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Why haven't you been able to become a great success? And we, we love these, these kinds of success stories in the U.S. And there is a part of me that I, I do want to say, yes, you, you have to recognize how much there is a, there's a capacity for 
self-fashioning that goes under-recognized in many people because they sell themselves short, because they have to deal with the self-understanding, which has diminished their expectations of what they could do. There's all this. On the other hand, it becomes a tyrannical playing field for just abuses of power in all kinds of political and social situations, right? It, it, devastating effects in the way that we think about health care, in the way that we think about possibilities of of alternative forms of education and education more generally. And it's it's kind of criminal the way that we, we toss people to the wolves and blame them for their situations in life as if it's all an individual's uh, effort and choice that made everything possible. I think resolving that ambiguity of being able to talk competently about the struggle of of self-understanding as that plays out in the myth of neoliberalism and how that myth is essential for some people to learn to take themselves seriously but is so detrimental when applied socially and you see again the kind of kind of horrific gutting out of of genuine community in US culture um, Okay, well, those are some thoughts. Thanks. Hopefully that was a response for those people with those questions, and thanks. Uh, people have other questions, feel free to send them. Bye.